Since the second installment of the franchise, Gears of War has always had three pillars of gameplay. The campaign, multiplayer PvP, or player versus player, and PvE, or player versus environment. In a previous video, I went over everything that's great about Gears of War's PvP, and towards the end I mentioned a bit of its cooperative offerings. While PvP is enjoyable, it's only one third of what makes this franchise so great in my eyes, so I wanted to dedicate an entire video to the multitude of PvE modes Gears has had over its 15 plus year lifespan. I did an overview of Gears of War's main gameplay in my PvP video, but I'll do a quick recap here just in case. Gears is a third person cover based shooter. Players are equipped with two weapons, a grenade, and a pistol. Taking cover and shooting at enemies is the name of the game. Once you drain your clip, you can perform what is known as an active reload. Timing the reload perfectly speeds up the animation and grants you a damage buff. Mess the timing up and you jam your weapon. Jamming your weapon can leave you exposed and cause you to take damage. Taking enough damage will cause you to enter what is known as the down but not out stage. Here you can crawl to safety and be revived by your teammates. Taking more damage in this state, however, leads to death. Staying in cover, taking out your enemies, nailing your active reloads, and not getting down is gears in a nutshell. It gets a bit more complicated than that, but those are the basics. With that quick explanation out of the way, let's get right into it. I've mentioned before how I'm a big fan of wave-based defensive modes. Fighting waves upon waves of enemies, your backs up against the wall, scavenging for ammo and weapons, and fighting to survive as long as possible. This is the base that Gears 2's Horde mode is built upon. Gears of War 2's Horde mode was the first go around for this style of gameplay, meaning it's basic, at least compared to future attempts. A team of 5 players takes on 50 waves of increasingly difficult enemies. Killing every enemy on the map ends the round, anyone who died fighting the good fight can respawn. If everyone dies, it's game over. Full disclosure, I found it very difficult to find a full party for Horde mode in Gears 2 even with backwards compatibility on Xbox One. That being said, I didn't enjoy myself as much as my memory serves. A mode made for a team of five doesn't play as well when you're alone, but that doesn't mean I didn't have at least a little bit of fun. There's a nice simplicity to the first Horde mode, and the only reason it still works is the same reason that Gears 2 works overall, its enemy variety. What Gears 2's Horde mode lacks in points, multipliers, and defenses, it more than makes up for with the ranks of locusts you'll fight. The Boomer family of enemies alone has a myriad of variants from the cleaver-wielding butchers to the minigun fire firing grinders. Typical drones wielding everything from hammer bursts to lancers to boltox, the cantus who can resurrect down enemies, close quarter threats like wretches, blood mounts, or tickers. There's a crazy amount of enemies to fight which makes no two rounds alike, making Gears 2's horde mode fun regardless of its bare bones nature. Its simplicity allows for player creativity when defending against the locust onslaught. Horde matches take place on multiplayer maps, which I find to be interesting from a design perspective. It's clear the maps were created for multiplayer matches of execution, warzone, guardian, etc, but when applied to horde mode, these same maps are seen in a different light. Teams have the best shot of surviving by picking a spot on the map to defend as best as possible. You could try to hold up with your backs against the wall on a spawn point with good cover, or find a height advantage and cover the entry points. Choosing an easy spot to hold up as a team with little flanking routes and good sight lines was key, and even using some game mechanics to your advantage like planting grenades to cover your blind spots, or the classic river boom shield strategy. Something PvE modes like Horde do well is highlight Gear's fantastic set of weapons. This is something that's a constant across all Gear's games, as the length of a Horde game far outlasts your traditional multiplayer match. Like I mentioned in my PvP video, multiplayer matches typically boil down to Nasher vs Nasher, and while that can be exhilarating, it excludes most of Gears of War's arsenal of fun weapons to use. Assault rifles like the Lancer or Hammer Burst are good for medium to long range fights with a variety of shotguns to use when a grub doesn't respect your personal space. Pistols have a lot of longevity in PvE modes, as holding onto them as a last resort is always a good idea, especially with the meat shield mechanic Gears 2 implemented. My personal favorite has to be the Boltock, a bag them so powerful it can blow the head clean off a boomer. Where things really open up are the power weapons. Power weapons spawn on the map in traditional fashion, but with the waves of enemies comes enemies wielding them as well. Power weapons are usually used in set pieces in the campaign or fought over tirelessly in multiplayer matches, so to have more access to them in PvE is great. They're also much more viable in Horde and PvE as well. I love the likes of the Mortar, but if you're being honest, it's pretty useless in online matches, but it can do wonders in Horde. Going back to Gears of War 2's Horde mode is a bit like playing the first game in a beloved series. It's in its infancy, and while fun can still be had, it's clear it's just the starting point, a base to be built upon for further entries.
Gears of War 3 launched with Horde 2.0, a complete overhaul of the classic mode that brought with it a ton of new additions and features that have been staples moving forward. To break up the monotony of a 1 to 50 wave battle, Horde 2.0 introduces bosses every 10 waves. Now, larger scale enemies like Brumox, Berserkers, and Reavers can get in on the mix and provide a higher challenge for those who can survive long enough. These bosses add more variety on top of the standard enemies you'll face prior to them. They each have their own strategies, with some being easier than others. For example, Berserkers have to either be lit on fire to damage or targeted with a direct Hammer of Dawn strike to kill, otherwise they'll decimate your team pretty quickly. Brumox are massive and take up a good chunk of the map. With rocket launchers and chain guns, it's the biggest threat the Locust can throw at you. On top of the already great variety of Locusts to fight in the new bosses, the Lambent also make an appearance in Horde. The Lambent are grotesque, mutated Locusts infected with demulsion and come in all shapes and sizes. Gunkers, Lambent drones, polyps, formers, and drudges add to the lineup of enemies you can face in Horde 2.0, making it the most content-rich entry in that department. Gears 3 had some small but neat additions that aided in the camaraderie of the gameplay. Players are now able to trade weapons with one another as well as give cash to their teammates. The biggest addition has to be the spotting mechanic. This is universal across the entirety of Gears 3, but it can be really useful in Horde. Being able to ping a power weapon your teammates can utilize or target a more powerful enemy for your team to focus fire on can aid in the overall experience. Epic took note of player behavior in Gears 2 and created an entire defensive fortification system around those tactics. At the beginning of each game, teams have to choose a location to set up a command center in order to gain access to defensive options like caltrops barriers, decoys, and turrets. To obtain and maintain these defensive measures, players earn currency from assists, executions, revivals, and of course kills. Cash can be used to upgrade caltrops to laser gates, give sentries longer range, or increase the aggro effectiveness of decoys. New to Horde 2.0 are wave-based objectives that will grant players bonus crates as well as cash upon completing them. These can range from executing a set number of enemies or pulling off a certain amount of headshots during a round. You'll need the extra money too, because after each boss wave, enemies get stronger and more lethal as the rounds continue, meaning upgrading your fortifications is a must if you plan on surviving to wave 50. Some of my favorite defensive measures to utilize are the command center, which can unleash sniper fire, mortar bombardments, or hammer of dawn strikes as it's upgraded, as well as unlocking the devastating silverback to tear locusts to shreds. Horde 2.0 was almost a total overhaul of Gears 2's original version and is all better for it. It takes the great wave-based defense mode and builds upon it in so many ways, it would be the definitive version of the mode in the series for years to come. In addition to campaign, PvP, multiplayer, and horde, Epic doubled down on PvE with Gears 3 with the addition of Beast Mode. A fan favorite, Beast Mode allowed players to finally control the monsters of the Locust Horde. A reverse of Horde 2.0 of sorts, players have to utilize various Locusts and their abilities to push past the defenses of the COG and kill any gear in sight. Every round gets tougher as COG heroes join the fray, wielding power weapons as well as their fortifications improving. Kills or fortification destruction, that's players' points they can use to spend on different Locusts from wretches to drones to blood mounts to boomers. Some of my favorites have to be the Cantus, who can heal allies and toss ink grenades to flush enemies out of cover, or the Corpser, who can slash at gears with their massive appendages and burrow underground for a surprise attack. There are four tiers of Locusts to work with. Contributing enough during a round will net you points towards the next tier. While teamwork isn't as important in Beast as it is in Horde, there are advantages in using one Locust over another. For example, wretches can hop over cover and spikes, reaching enemies quicker and stunning them for their teammates for a quick kill. Grenadiers wield shotguns and aren't very useful at range, but were equipped with frag grenades that can make quick work of fortifications. It's not as tactical or in-depth as Horde 2.0, but it doesn't have to be, nor do I think that was the point. While it's only 12 waves, it's a short burst of fun that allows you to play from the other side of the conflict and try out various different playstyles not seen in Gears up to that point. Sadly, Beast has yet to return to the series and is only playable in Gears 3, a trend that would, unfortunately, continue. Gears of War Judgment is the black sheep of the series, with most criticizing its overhaul of the controls, game mechanics, and multiplayer as detrimental to the overall Gears experience. While the sweeping changes Judgment made to the core of the Gears formula are contentious, there are some things that I do like about the game. Along with the unique campaign, Judgment also introduced a new PvE mode called Survival. Survival replaces Horde 2.0 from Gears 3, and while it's similar, it certainly has its differences, some of which are welcomed additions. Just like Horde, Survival mode pits 5 players against waves of increasingly difficult Locust forces, but the 
the biggest change is the addition of a central objective. Cord usually boiled down to just survive as long as you can, and usually if you had a decent team and some luck, you'd be able to make it to wave 50. Survival only lasts 10 waves, and has players defending emergence hole covers that the locusts want to destroy to have access to more reinforcements. If an e-hole is uncovered, players move back a sector to defend a second e-hole. Having that destroyed leads to the final sector, which houses a generator. If the generator is destroyed, it's game over. This objective-based approach is great in my opinion. It's more streamlined and focused on defending specific areas instead of letting players loose on an open-ended map like in Horde. Speaking of which, level design is taken into account in survival, and unlike in Horde mode, survival has its own exclusive maps. These levels are designed in a way that there's always multiple areas an objective can be attacked from, making any match hectic as locusts can come from almost anywhere. This makes teamwork extremely important, especially when you take into account the new class system. There are four classes to choose from. The Soldier, Thrashball Superstar of the Coal Train, the Medic, Onyx Guard Cadet Sophia Hendrick, the Scout, Goroznian Refugee, Garen Paddock, and the Engineer, the Loudmouth Damon Baird. Each class has their own weapon loadouts and abilities, and utilizing these abilities along with teamwork is essential for survival. The Soldier can generate ammo crates for the team, the Medic can toss stim gas grenades to heal or revive down teammates, the Sniper has a beacon grenade that can tag enemies on the HUD, and the Engineer has the ability to repair fortifications when damaged. It's enjoyable to play as any class, as they're all capable of both active and passive playstyles. Sniping from the back with Paddock to take out bigger threats and revealing enemy locations, wielding the Bushka with Cole and being able to supply ammo crates to your team, providing cover fire with Sophia while resing a downed teammate, or taking out a Locust who's breaking down your barrier only to repair it with Baird. Needless to say, the class-based system is excellent and is something that will come up a little bit later as well. Survival matches invoke this sense of desperation. Waves can be long and seem to never end, with Locust relentlessly trying to destroy your fortifications, wipe your team out, and destroy the objective. In a lot of ways, survival is Horde boiled down to its essence, of just holding out long enough to survive a wave, regrouping, and doing it again. The shorter length means it's constant action from the get-go. Where Horde can be a gradual climb in difficulty from waves 1 to 50, by wave 4 or 5, survival's difficulty kicks it into high gear, making surviving 10 waves pretty difficult. The shorter length keeps it from getting dull, you can respond and change classes mid-match, giving players a lot of flexibility. The classes are a lot of fun to use, especially in tandem with your teammates. I've gotta say, I found my time with survival a lot of fun, more than I remembered honestly. While survival isn't as grandiose as Horde 2.0, I don't think it has to be. It's short, sweet, and to the point. It's a rapid-fire defense and test of skill and teamwork. It's not perfect, but it's a unique take on the wave-based defense mode. My only real complaint with survival would have to be what made Horde mode stand out before it, and that's its enemy variety. For continuity reasons, there's no Savage Locust or Lambent, nor are there boss waves, so it's just the ground soldiers from the campaign, and since it's based around the new Overrun mode, the variety of Locusts can't hold a candle to the likes of Horde 2.0, although I do like the Rager, who acts like a mini Berserker of sorts, and the Mauler Elite, with its spinning boom shield that can reflect bullets back at you. Speaking of Overrun, this is technically cheating since Overrun is PvP and not PvE, but it shares so many similarities with Survival that it's worth a mention, and I don't really plan on talking about Judgment at all in the future, so... Overrun is essentially Survival mode mixed with Beast mode from Gears 3. It's a 5v5 mode where one team plays as the Cog defending the previously mentioned E-holes, and the other plays as the Locust trying to push the Cog back and destroy the Generator. Teams swap after a round ends with either the Cog defending an objective for a certain amount of time, or the Locust destroying each objective. While playing as the Locust isn't as fleshed out as Beast mode, i.e. there's less Locust to control, it's still fun to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other players as Cog and Locust with a whole new playstyle than your traditional Gears multiplayer. I'm not alone in wanting Overrun to make a return, but sadly, just like Beast mode and Survival, Overrun has yet to re-emerge in any title since Judgment. Gears of War 4 is almost a soft reboot of the franchise in a way. While the lore and characters have remained, the series went back to its roots in more ways than one. A more intimate, small-scale campaign with horror overtones, a return of the classic control scheme and multiplayer game modes that Judgment lacked, and going back to the basics of the three-pillar system of campaign, multiplayer, and horde, or in this case, Horde 3.0. Horde 3.0 is fairly interesting. It's not the massive leap in innovation from Gears 2 to 3, but its additions were intelligently made to an overall fantastic base to create something pretty special. The same base from Horde 2.0 still exists, with waves 1 to 50 of increasingly difficult enemy resistance, with bosses sprinkled in every 10 waves. Gears 4 features two new enemy factions in the Swarm and the DBs. While there are a lot of enemies to fight, I don't find either to be all that interesting, considering they're far too similar to the Locusts mechanically. Juvies are wretches, trackers are tickers, sirens are boomers mixed with cantuses, etc, etc. There are some enemies I do enjoy, primarily the Guardians and Sentinels, that add a rare aerial threat to the Gears ecosystem, and the Pouncer who can jump around the map and is lethal from far and 
close range. New to Gears 4's version of Horde is the Fabricator, a wonderful little device that not only ties in well with the lore of the campaign, but also has the ability to, well, fabricate. All the fortifications you've come to know and love from Horde 2.0 can be created and placed anywhere on the map. This opens up the possibilities even more than Gears 3 did, now allowing players to choose anywhere on the map they want to defend and not have to be restricted with the predetermined locations. The player freedom is amazing, being able to hold up in corners of the map with layers of barriers or lock down flanking routes with as many turrets as you can. This time around, fortification upgrades are based on the level of the Fabricator, which increases in level the more power is contributed to it. This means teamwork is important in gathering as much power as possible and dividing it between leveling up the Fabricator and defending your current position, and gives teams more of a long-term goal overall. I would be remiss though if I didn't say I liked Gears 3's take on upgrades a little bit more though. The Fabricator also has access to the entire arsenal of weapons Gears 4 has on offer, meaning you're never without an option if you run out of ammo. It even offers the repair tool from Gears Judgment, allowing anyone to repair fortifications at the cost of some power. Speaking of power, it's the new currency in Horde 3.0. A small tweak from Gears 3 to 4 sees players having to physically collect power that drops from dispatched foes, meaning if you want the most bang for your buck, you'll have to actively collect the power throughout the round, or be quick enough to clean it all up before the next round starts. Bonus challenges make a return, and they're still a great addition. The incentive is playing a certain way during the round to complete the challenge, thus being rewarded with a supply drop that can house power weapons or more ammo. Dying this time around is less punishing as your teammates can grab your cog tags and bring you back from the dead by depositing them into the fabricator. While this is a small change, it can turn the tide in some of the tougher rounds, bringing back a fallen comrade to even the odds. Horde 3.0 also features the triumphant return of classes. Taking inspiration from Judgment's survival mode, Gears 4 brought back the class-based system of only this time, players' characters are separated from their classes. Gears 4 shakes up the four classes Judgment had, with a new set of classes in the Soldier, the Scout, the Sniper, the Heavy, and the Engineer class. I will admit, Judgment's classes were a bit more diverse, with each of Gears 4's classes being relatively the same besides some passive abilities here and there. But, players can differentiate themselves within these classes with skill cards. Skill cards offer buffs in certain aspects, like increased damage or fortification improvements, which are all based on what class you prefer. Each skill card can level up based on performance, adding a sense of overall progression the mode didn't have prior to Gears 4. While the skill card system wasn't great, mostly because of the microtransactions attached to them, they're at least a great idea to start fleshing out Horde in a new and interesting way. While Gears of War 3's Horde 2.0 was a massive leap for the mode, Gears of War 4's Horde 3.0 improves upon it in small incremental ways that makes it much more approachable and enjoyable as a result. But in my opinion, the best was yet to come. Gears 5 is hard to judge at the moment. At launch, I would have told you that Gears 5 was a step back in a lot of ways, but over the past year or so, the Coalition has improved the game tenfold in almost every aspect. Starting with Horde mode, the launch version was more of the same from Gears 4, with a few tweaks here and there. Right off the bat, an upgrade from 30 FPS to 60 FPS makes a world of difference. Playing Gears in 60 frames per second is a dream, and going back can be a bit of a challenge. Enemies now sport health bars, which is a welcome inclusion. It's not necessarily useful for smaller enemies like drones, but when it comes to the more tankier enemies, and especially bosses, it can be really helpful to know how much health they have left. A bit of a difference from Gears 4 is that energy is no longer pooled instantly once interacting with the Fabricator. It now can be either deposited or used in your own inventory. This now makes it possible to personally buy weapons, upgrade fortifications, or utilize the new perk system. Just like weapons and fortifications, perks cost energy, but are solely applied to you. Each class has their own tailor-made mini skill tree of sorts, and where you can spec into increased damage, health, ammo capacity, fortification repair, etc, etc. This system poses an interesting decision. Do you spend the energy you've accumulated on yourself, or do you use it for the fortifications to help your team? It's not revolutionary by any means, but it is a welcome addition nonetheless. Also new to Gears 5 Horde mode is energy taps. Taps mine energy constantly and can crop up in different positions on the map. These taps will collect energy over time and store it for you and your teammates to collect from, giving you a lump sum of power all at once. Taps operate off the same logic as fortifications, that being that they have a life meter and can be repaired, but enemies will attack and destroy them if given the opportunity. Taps are an interesting inclusion, but I wouldn't say they're a game changer like the previous editions. It is neat to have sort of an objective again like survival, where once a tap shows up, your team almost naturally gravitates towards and builds around it to protect it. And just like in survival, classes return but have changed drastically since launch. Gears 5 launch horde mode had classes tied to each character, and with a very limited character pool and no overlap in character selection, the mode quickly became something of an afterthought for most players. That all changed with Operation 4 and 5, which separated characters from classes, allowing 
for numerous combinations of characters and classes to choose from. There are a ton of classes on offer now, which does wonders for replayability and experimentation. Some of my favorites are the combat medic that can revive anyone who's been down instantly, the robotic expert that can spawn a DR1 to help in the battle, or the anchor class that can generate a protective energy shield. Along with the big class change is the change to Horde itself. Classified now as Horde Frenzy, it's 12 waves with a boss wave every 4 rounds. The power you earn has been tweaked to accommodate the reduced rounds and everything seems sped up. If I'm being honest, this is the shot in the arm that Horde needed. Surviving 50 waves with your buddies or a well-oiled machine of a team was a lot of fun, but it wasn't efficient to say the least. Getting into the higher waves, anything past round 30 or so, was where the challenge usually started with the first half of Horde matches being very slow sometimes to the point of boredom. On the flip side, once you get closer and closer to wave 50, you've put at least a good hour or so into the match, and to fall just short, while well, logical, is frustrating considering you dedicated over an hour of your time building defenses and staying alive for it all to go to hell and be over before you know it. Horde Frenzy is now the default in Gears 5, and it's for the better, honestly. Its streamlined gives you that defensive, back-against-the-wall, fighting-for-your-life gameplay you love with a quarter of the time investment. With the Frenzy changes along with the class system tweaks in Operation 5, I can honestly say Horde is at its very best in Gears 5. But even at its best, Horde can't top, at least in my opinion, one of the best Gears modes to date, and that's Escape Mode. Escape was revealed in E3 2019 as Gears 5's big marketing push. Escape pitted a team of three Gears to infiltrate a hive, plant a Venom Bomb, and escape before the Venom spread to the rest of the hive. Its foundation, gameplay-wise, is fantastic. It has a lot of elements of Horde, Battle Royale modes, and campaign missions, with players having the previously mentioned class system at their disposal, only starting with a pistol and having the scavenge for weapons and ammo as Venom pushes players closer and closer to the exit, as well as small story elements that tie in with the established lore. Escape's premise is just so cool to me. Using the Swarm's tactics against them, Gears, or Hive Busters as they've been referred to, purposely get themselves grabbed by a Snatcher, a grotesque monster that swallows people up to be returned to the nearest Swarm Hive and potted, a process that turns humans into Swarm Drones. Once potted, the Hive Busters free themselves from their pods deep within the Hive and fight their way out, destroying the Hive in the process. Escape might be my favorite PvE mode since the original Horde back in Gears 2. It has so many things going for it. I like the three-man team, Spec Ops-like infiltration, having to rely on your skills as weapons are scarce and ammo even scarcer, the ticking clock of the Venom adding a layer of tension to the whole experience as you're balancing rushing to the end and having to fend off waves of the swarm. Gears 5 leaned hard into the games as a service model, and while it's been a bumpy ride since launch, I will say, Escape is where it felt like it works the best. Periodically, a new hive will release with a different layout and focus. Some have bosses prowling the hive, others have increased venom, some can be mazes, or some limit which enemies or weapons can spawn. There's near endless possibilities, and it's fun to hop on every once in a while and try out the new hive. Just like Horde, Escape has its classes and characters separated, and with the exclusive Hive Buster armor skins for some of my favorite characters, it can be a blast utilizing the multitude of classes to form an elite three-man team of Hive Busters. As you can probably tell by now, PvE is part of Gears of War's identity. From playing co-op in the original to escaping hives in Gears 5, Gears of War has embraced PvE and it's for the better. While the PvP modes are what keeps me coming back, Gears PvE modes has me staying far longer than expected. With Gears 5 continuing to add new content and DLC, here's hoping we see a return of some of the forgotten modes like Beast or Overrun, and that Gears 6 keeps the momentum going with Escape and Horde. And who knows, we might even get a whole new mode entirely, even a Gears take on the popular Battle Royale mode. But until then, I'll be jumping into Horde or Escape matches on a regular, possibly unhealthy basis for the foreseeable future.